Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we are back working on the Alferrari. Alright guys, thanks for joining me again. Those who were watching last week will have seen that I redid my bonnet bulge and overall the, uh, the impression seems to be uh, that it's much better, but ultimately I think it's much better and that's uh, what really matters. I am very happy with the result and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something I can live with now. I <laughs> really, really was struggling before. But if you guys missed it, I'll put a link up above uh, and you can catch up. And if you haven't subscribed, uh, hit the subscribe button, it does help us out. Now, uh, I just want to cover a couple of the, uh, the reoccurring comments that were coming through. Um, first one that I think seemed pretty obvious, and I have mentioned it before, that, uh, that this hole is going to have a Lexan cover in it, so you will be able to see the, uh, the engine through it. Uh, I thought that was pretty obvious, but some people obviously didn't realise that. Um, there were lots of comments of people saying that I should um, put ducts going into the bonnet. You should never have any air entering into the bonnet line. If anything, you'd have air coming out of the bonnet. The only reason you would ever put air going in is if you're actually going into an airfield or something like that. There is definitely no room for that, and it also, I, I'm not a fan of the look of that. Um, or you could have it like a WRX going into an intercooler. It's actually going in for that. But for cooling just around the engine, that's a terrible idea. The best, if anything, you would let the air come out of the, 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 the near the back of the bonnet and let air flow through because you otherwise you're just going to create a, uh, a turbulent area and create drag. It's not a good idea. Um, the other recurring comment was that uh, this bonnet bulge is now very tight to the engine, and it is. Um, there is a bit of space there, but not a lot. The engine is gonna move around a bit, but um, those who've watched and seen the engine mounts that I built, the cotton reel mounts that are uh, uh, polyurethane mounts, they're not gonna allow the engine to move very much at all. Uh, there's about 10 mil of gap in there, which is about all the gap I've got in lots of places on this engine. So if the engine's rocking around more than 10 mil, uh, it's going to be <laughs> touching stuff. It's just, this engine is so big and it's so tight, there's just no room anywhere. So, um, yeah, I'm not overly concerned about that. If it becomes an issue, then we can, you know, deal with things. Anyway, it's time to get to work. And today I thought we would uh, go back into the engine bay and start doing a few other bits and pieces. Okay, so moving back into the engine bay, I have mentioned before, but basically my plan with this engine bay is to try and make it as neat and clean as possible. So as when you open the bonnet, basically all you're gonna see is this nice, pretty Ferrari engine sitting in the middle and everything else is pretty much clean and clear. So there's no other clutter in the engine bay. I am also a fan of symmetry, and you might have seen that uh, when I put in my dry sump oil tank that I built into the front guard in here, um, I've got the oil fill location right here in uh, the corner of the engine bay and now I need to fit a washer bottle so um, I, this car didn't have anything with it when I got it but uh, I believe a lot of them were a, a bag that sort of sat in the uh, side of the engine bay over this side here and A I don't have it and B I don't want anything else in the engine bay uh, so I think I'm going to build a new washer bottle and I think I might make the fill point matching this on the other side, over here. So as many of you are used to by now, I'm having microphone issues again, but I'm gonna repurpose this radiator expansion tank I have and make it into my washer bottle. And I've gone over to my Audi rec and I've pulled out the washer pump, so let's get into it. Wow, that is a powerful little washer. 
So let me just run you quickly through what I did to get this going. I used a cup of boiling water. I don't, if some of you don't realize, that's a good way to uh, get tight hoses to get a bit more flex. And uh, yeah, once I put it in the boiling water, I managed to, to flare it out enough to get it over the fittings I needed to get to. And now I've got the basic system that works. I know this tank is going to work. So now it's time to start getting it ready to put into the car, which means a bit more modifying. All right, so I've uh, just temporarily taped the, uh, the washer bottle motor to the side of the tank. And it's gonna go inside here, somewhere like that. The filler location is right here, so I'm gonna have to run a, uh, I'm gonna have to make up an aluminum pipe to go through to join it up. And uh, I think that will be a nice, neat washer bottle solution. So let's start uh, punching the hole through first, see if I can match it up with the other side, get it nice and even and symmetrical. Then we'll start making the hole meet the tank. All right, so you saw me there. I, I drilled and used my hydraulic punch to punch the hole for the, uh, the new Raceworks filler that I'm going to use that will match in with the other side. And um, I recently bit the bullet and switched to a battery die grinder. It's not sponsored, but uh, so much better than the air tools. Like, like I found even with a reasonable size compressor that the uh, the, the air would just, just run out and it would get, it would die really quickly. Air tools use a lot of air pressure and uh, this is such a big difference, such a game changer. No cord obviously and uh, yeah, it works much better. So now I've moved on to mounting the tank. So I'll bring you down under here and I'll show you what I'm doing. All right, it's hard to see, but the, uh, the tank is in here now and I've uh, drilled one hole on the far side. It's actually pivoting on that now. But this other side here, I need a bit of tab to go to that bolting spot. So I'm gonna bend this up now and weld a captive nut into it and make my mount that I can weld onto the inside frame of the car. And there we have it, our mount is all welded in. So you can see here that I have taped three pieces of my pipe together to make my inlet for my washer bottle and uh, it's all in place now so I need to take it out again, tack it together, cut a hole in the washer bottle and connect it all up. All right, so now I've welded up my inlet for my washer bottle. It's all joined together. Um, quick tip for young players. Do not mix up your stainless steel with your aluminium TIG welding wire. I started really struggling. I started trying to weld the, uh, the aluminium together and um, it just was not welding nicely and it, and it sort of cracked and I wondered what was going on. Yes, yeah, stainless steel doesn't really work very well on aluminium. <laughs> they are very different things.
<laughs> anyway, I got it there in the end. So uh, let's now work out exactly how we need to uh, connect this up and weld it on to our washer bottle. All right, so a little bit of playing around and I have my new inlet uh, for my washer bottle. So let's put the washer bottle back in the car and see how it looks. All right, so that was a little bit of work there to actually make up my arm, my filler neck for my washer bottle and it's all welded in there. It's all ready to go. Now I did actually make it in two pieces so that uh, this piece I can just hold together with a, uh, a silicon joiner. That way uh, it's easier to adjust the, uh, the, how much this nozzle sticks in and out. Same as what I've done on the dry sump tank. So I can keep everything nice and neat and symmetrical. So uh, let's have a look at it on the inside. Okay, so I'm very happy with that result. I've got a nice, neat, symmetrical oil filler on that side and uh, uh, washer filler on this side. I'll probably have to see if I can get them laser etched or something like that to, to label them, but for now, I am happy to leave that as it is and move forward on to something else. All right, well, next, I thought it was finally time to get around to fixing up this uh, rust in the back when I was doing my rear window opening uh, mechanisms. There were lots of people going, why are you bothering with that when you still got this? This is looks horrible, but it's actually not that horrible to, uh, to repair. So let's get on to doing that right now. Alright, so I've, uh, as you've seen, I've put this first patch in and it's a reasonably straight section so I've, uh, I, I did use the shrinker stretcher a little bit to get a little bit of shape there but uh, I need to work uh, a bit harder up this top corner to get a piece in. At first I was going to try and do one piece to fit the whole thing but it would be too straight and wouldn't match the curves and even as it is, I can't do a three layer piece as in uh, with two folds because uh, you can't stretch the bit in the middle so that's why I've done this angle bit first and then I'll do a flat panel over the top to go with that so I'm going to get this in the shrinker now and curve this edge to, to mimic this curve along here it's not going to lean a lot but a little bit will uh, we'll just give it that curve to match in with what's there so basically what this thing does is it's got uh, some fine little jaws inside actually I'll bring out the stretcher so these are the jaws inside the stretcher so you can sort of see they've got some little lines on them and they're actually uh, two pieces they're uh, they're held together and as as this clamps down this pulls this one will will grab the metal and then pull it apart and these ones grabs the metal and squishes it together so by squishing this edge together you can actually see that it's actually put a little curve in it. It's not huge because uh, as I said I don't want a, uh, a, a very large curve but that is almost what I need. Just adding that little bit of curve in it rather than being a straight bend gives us more of the natural shape that the car had there and uh, the 
patch will look much, much better in the end. One more run through this and then we'll put on the car. All right, right is gone from there, but now I need to come around this side and I'll bring you around here and show you the next bit I've got to uh, tackle. And this one's gonna be a little bit tricky. Yeah, this one's gonna be a little bit more tricky, just, just the shape of the uh, the pieces in there, but we'll get a piece in there and patch it and should be all good. All right, well, it's not the prettiest repair, but uh, it's all nice and solid now. This whole pillar is all done. This, These little rust repairs, I just sort of left them because they were things that I need to tackle. They just take time. And that has taken all my time today. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, in 1955 there was a lot of anticipation for the upcoming 24 hours of Le Mans with Mercedes, Jaguar and Ferrari, all previous winners and all with new and improved cars. Ferrari had its 735 LM, Jaguar had its D-Type and Mercedes with its 300 SLR. The SLR had an all new body made from an ultra lightweight magnesium alloy, but it lacked the disc brakes of the D-Type, having inboard drums instead. Ferrari took an early lead in the race, but it dropped back, making it a race between Juan Manuel Fangio in the Mercedes and Mike Hawthorne in the D-Type. By the end of lap 35, Hawthorne was in the lead and passed a slower lapped driver in his Austin Healey, Lance Macklin, on the left, and then quickly pulled over to the right to start braking for the pits. Macklin swerved left to avoid the rapidly braking Jaguar directly into the path of another oncoming SLR Mercedes driven by Frenchman Pierre Louvet. The Mercedes, which had a closing speed of 200 kilometers an hour, hit the back of the Healy. This forced it into the air and over the barrier into the crowded pack of spectators, where it disintegrated over 100 meters, killing 83 people and the driver, Pierre Levé. The car being magnesium burned for almost 24 hours as the rescuers and the firemen were not trained for that type of fire. To this day, it is the single worst disaster in motor racing history and sparked a huge change to motor safety procedures moving forward. All right, well, that is a uh, another one down. I'm I'm quite happy with what I did on this uh, washer bottle, but after actually uh, reaching out to Raceworks today, they actually make a washer bottle very similar to that now that uh, they haven't put on their website yet, but they have finally have it available. So it might have saved me a bit of work, but uh, either way, that I still would have had to make that uh, all meet up. I like the symmetry of having those two caps there. Uh, yeah, just nice, neat engine bay is what I'm going for. And uh, yeah, rust repairs. There's still a few bits and pieces to do around the place. But uh, we are getting closer by the day. We sure are. It's exciting. So, um, as always. Please like, subscribe, and let Jeff know what you think. He loves reading your comments. He's reading them. I hear him go. <laughs> <laughs> you always give me. Yeah. yeah anyway. <laughs> yes. So thanks. Thanks for uh, yeah commenting. Uh, yeah. Always. Always happy to see them. So. Uh, yeah. All right. Have a good one, guys. See, see you guys. Next time. In 1955, there was a lot of anticipation for <laughs> Jaguar with its D-type and the. What did I say? You said Jaguar. What is it? Jaguar. Jaguar. Jaguar is what Americans say. Jaguar. It's a Jaguar. No American. The SLR had an all... Can you stop doing that, please? It's quite distracting. Mm. <laughs> Lightweight magnesium. The SLR had an... The SLR had an... Oh, stop it. <laughs> the force of the... <clears throat> damn it. 
Lance Healy. Macklin and his Healy. 